Well, yeah, you're right. 1977 was the big year. You don't realise it at the time. And then I was playing to 20 or 30 people in a pub. At the end of that year, um, we'd done the whistle test. We'd done, um, we'd had the hit. We'd done Top of the Pops. That was just such a such a wonderful year when you woke up in the morning thinking, "Wow, life's great." And I thought I'd always continue waking up in the morning thinking, "Wow, life's great." Once I'd had a hit, I didn't realise there'd be a lot of times when you'd <laughs> you'd cover, you know, you get the pillow cover your head and go, "No." <laughs> I think that whistle testing hadn't happened in the way that it had. Um, I think we'd have still gone on to have some success, but it wouldn't have been overnight success. Um, I know Peter Gabriel had invited us to do the European tour shortly before that. So we were picking up, um, picking up audiences. And the fact that we um, were invited to play the um, old girl whistle test anyway meant that, you know, my career was going in the right direction. But that was just, you know, a phenomenon and there was life before that happened and life afterwards and there were two quite different animals. I mean, it's always intended to last my whole life. I mean, I, I, I can remember, you know, well, when I was young and people sort of saying, that, yes, but it only lasts a few years, what are you going to do with the rest of your life? And instinctively, I thought, no, it's always going to last the rest of your life. Um, don't know why I thought that, but I did, yes. Went down in town for a cup of tea and I saw two skinnies looking at me. I'll give him head butts. I'll give him head butts. I'll give him head butts. I think the thing with me and Willie was, for years and years, he, he, he was competitive. I mean, we were both from, both from Aylesbury, and we both felt we were going to succeed. And one of the reasons we worked together was, was because we were both ambitious and we both desperately wanted to get somewhere, you know, more ambitious than anybody else I knew. And Willie was a stunningly good musician, and, you know, what I was doing was working on stage. So it was a good idea to get together, but the problem was that because we were quite competitive. We just regarded each other as a stepping stone to where we wanted to get. So any time any success came along, we couldn't wait to ditch each other to go on and have our own success. And I mean, we weren't very, we weren't very nice to each other. We were quite ruthless to each other. And um, Willie was certainly no better than me, and I was certainly no better than Willie in, in, in that sort of behaviour. But it's only really uh, in the last, um, I suppose 15 years, that's about, that's about 15 years ago we sort of got back together and you sort of realise that that competition doesn't actually matter anymore. You know, you've laid down the foundation of your career, that's sort of what you will be. However, I sometimes think, well, he might well think that if he hadn't met me, his career might have been a bit better. <laughs> Oh yeah, I've discovered the hits have the habit of going to your head, and because um, it happened with the first hit, and uh, basically as badly with the with the second one, because um, the whole hit. I mean, I remember at the time, you know, thinking that was a rung on the ladder, and then discovering later, no, that was the ladder. <laughs> it wasn't going to get any better than this, and it took a long time to uh, to to, to realise that you know, um, you know. That was basically um, a pinnacle. It was very, very hard to get back to again. The physical aspect of the show has, has reduced. I remember on my 
65th birthday gig doing the somersault with a guitar. But it was starting to it was starting to get more more and more difficult. I remember realizing, unfortunately, that when I did a handstand, I couldn't keep the weight of my body on my two arms. Um, so it started to look a bit uh, a bit naff when you did a handstand and then just crumpled to the to the floor. Instead of people going, "Wow," <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Uh, somebody suggested doing Facebook Live, and so for the uh, first Saturday after the lockdown, I thought, well, I'll have a go. Just did it with a you know, locked off phone and did Facebook Live, and did a 20 minute show, and it actually worked very well. And I was quite surprised by the number of people actually tuned in. I think at the height we had 15,000 people watching it. Whenever I've thought about numbers of people, because I headlined the Alba Horn, that's 4,000. I've always uh, thought of things in multiples of Alba Halls. So when I realised we basically had nearly four Alba Halls watching Facebook Live, um, I realised that, that was really quite significant. It got really good reactions, so I, I kept doing them, and I ended up doing nine in all. So the week of the actual specific lockdowns before they started opening the pubs again for those nine weeks, um, I did have a routine because I had a Saturday show at eight o'clock to do. And because I didn't want to repeat myself and just did a similar show, um, I had to basically learn songs and write a script uh, for a 20 minute show every Saturday. For my 50th birthday, we had uh, a campaign to have another hit and everybody kept saying, what are you going to do for your 60th? And Mott Way the movie was something that obviously I'd always felt there should be at some point. I remember when I was about sort of 58, I remember a, a mate had um, a birthday party in the cinema and um, he'd put together a movie that he'd basically shot on, um, shot on a DSLR camera. and. I went to the party being amazed that you, you could actually just shoot something on one of these cameras and it looked perfectly good on a, a big cinema screen. That combined with um, Avatar, the movie Avatar, um, which came at a similar time, which meant most of the cinemas in, in, in the country uh, put digital projectors in. And it just became apparent to me that you could make up way the movie with uh, you know a good DSLR camera and you could edit it up on um, good Macintosh computer, and for a few thousand pounds, you basically had everything you needed to make a movie. Montserrat was beautiful. I mean, I'm, it's such a lovely um, project to have done from start to finish, to go to this island in the Caribbean, and to be welcomed that much, because from the... Uh, Prime Minister of Montserrat, everybody supported this idea of culture coming back, you know, that sort of culture coming back to the island, people coming there to record, that we were embraced by them. And taking the band over there and actually just creating something. And staying at Sir George Martin's house and recording there, you know, where you got up in the morning and you walked down the corridor with the Linda McCartney prints and um, all the gold records into this basement. Everybody, me and the band and the producer, all really felt you couldn't really go there and record a bunch of rubbish. And we were the first people to record there since the Rolling Stone recorded there in 1989. We got a No Steel Wheels album. So that's what we were following. Not that that was a particularly difficult album to follow. <laughs> I, think we, I think we gave it its run for, you know, run for the money. I think we've heard that before. Hello, good evening. Hello, good evening and welcome. Hello. It's a bit like that, where would you start? So many people do interviews like this and people sort of say, you know, would you change anything? And they go sage-like and go, no, on balance, I wouldn't change anything at all. I can't believe the opposite. I would change bleeding nearly everything. I mean, I can't see much of what I'd done that I couldn't do a hell of a lot better. 
And even really, three was an accident. I didn't, I didn't like the, the single and tried to stop, you know, stop it going out. <laughs> no, I, no, no, I mean, and, and, uh, and Geneva, and relationship. No, I mean, <laughs> it's, um, that joke, you know, it, uh, well, not a joke, but when I had my um, uh, f first autobiography uh, printed and the publisher wanted to call it Rock and Roll's Greatest Failure, um, they didn't pluck that uh, title out of thin air. Um, they just looked at my description of what I'd done and um, realised that um, you know, <laughs> there was a lot of banana skins there. I'd quite like, you know, John Otway, 11 plus failure. Yeah, um, <laughs> died with chip on shoulder. <laughs>